This is a story of Jack R. Jake Foot, F O O T E. I believe Jack was born and raised in Kerrville, Texas, but it's been 50 years ago since I've spoken to him, and uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Jack was a most unusual person and pilot that I spent a few months with overseas in 1944 and 1945. Uh, Jack's father was a pilot back in the days of the uh, flying circuses that toured the country, uh, barnstorming from town to town, uh, and so forth. Jack's mother was a beautiful wing walker. Uh, those of you who are familiar with aviation in the 1920s and 30s, uh, these people, uh, women in particular, actually got on the top wing of the old bioplanes and strapped down and um, went uh, for the ride uh, with uh, some acrobatics included and to the thrilling crowds of the farmers and small town people below. I said uh, strapped down, actually uh, they were standing upright and uh, so that the, uh, the crowds below can see them and they did flew and straighten level, uh, they did uh, loops and rolls with the pilot uh, in control trying at all times to uh, keep them uh, with at least one gravity holding them toward the wing to secure their uh, locking mechanism better. But anyway, uh, Jack was the son of a marriage of the pilot and the wing walker. Uh, these people uh, stayed with aviation through its leanest days uh, in the 30s uh, and uh, made a living with uh, flight schools and some charter work. And uh, then as uh, the 40s came along and World War II was on the horizon with American involvement. Uh, they ran civilian pilot training schools for the government and then uh, I think at the end or right during the war they uh, had an army primary school uh, at their airport. Uh, Jack uh, had learned to fly really uh, long before he could drive an automobile and um, was brought into a flying family uh, could fly just about anything almost to perfection and was by far the best pilot that I'd ever had an occasion to fly with. I did fly with him one time on a trip over the hump in 1944. But uh, that's an unusual background, but uh, not many of us are the, the son of a uh, old barnstorming pilot and, his, and a beautiful wing walker mother. Uh, Jack was only 24 years old, if I remember, but he was already married and had a family. He was a devoted family man. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He was very quiet. Uh, he didn't brag as to his flying experience, and he was an individual that I admired very much. Uh, even though I knew him uh, only a short time and not very well, uh, I did ask him to uh, be in my wedding and uh, March of, pardon me, February 1946, but for some reason uh, he couldn't make it at the very last minute. Um, Jack, unfortunately, was killed about 1947 or 48 uh, in the Denver area. He was employed by uh, Slick Airlines, the big air freight company of that time, and uh, was over Denver, Colorado in a thunderstorm uh, so bad that he was radio <clears throat> sent out radio messages for planes to stay out of that area and out of that particular uh, storm. Uh, they had structural damage to the plane. Uh, they tried twice to get the plane on the ground and couldn't control it on the ground. Uh, went around the field, came back again, 
and I think it was on the second or third time, uh, just as they uh, turned on the crosswind leg, the uh, vertical fin fell over on the stabilizer and spun in. It did not burn because uh, Jack, in his uh, capacity as a pilot, had uh, turned off the master switch and probably uh, saved it from burning, but the impact crushed uh, both pilots and the uh, radio operator forward. So Jack had a short life, but an old, most unusual one. Uh, this is a story that Jack told me in um, 1945, fall of 1945, about an experience that he had uh, in his hump flying days. He, uh, Jack was not one to, uh, to tell war stories. Uh, he didn't boast of his competence or incompetence like most of us did. Uh, but this story stuck in my mind as being so unusual and so typical of Jack that I thought after all these years, maybe I should get it on tape at least and hopefully uh, published so that it would be preserved for uh, generations to come and maybe uh, some of Jack's uh, children, grandchildren, uh, so forth would uh, maybe read this story and be interested in it. Um, the story does not have a name as yet. Uh, maybe we can come up with one. Uh, after you, we hear this, maybe fellas can help me. Um, after the big push, as our CO called it, was over, uh, it lasted four or five weeks, uh, Jack and I were uh, sitting in front of our bashes, kind of taking it easy for the first time in, in weeks, uh, drinking a couple of warm beers, and um, passing things over when Jack uh, began to tell a story. You know, it was so unusual for him to discuss his flying or hunt flying that uh, I immediately picked up my ears, pricked up my ears, and uh, listened uh, so that I could uh, uh, retain this because I knew with Jack put telling it, uh, that uh, it was going to be worth listening to. It had been uh, some of the most grueling weeks that either one of us had ever experienced. Um, Takeoffs before dawn, and, uh, landings at first daylight, and a, a grass muddy strip in central Burma that had just been uh, cleared uh, by, uh, I suppose, the Chinese First Army, um, who had taken a hell of a licking from the Japs and showed it. And we were to uh, fly, uh, pick up the Chinese First Army in central Burma uh, somewhere between Mishnah and Peishan, if I remember correctly, and fly them to Chinese, pardon me, to China, to Chanyi, C-H-A-N-Y-I, Chanyi, China, for regrouping and retraining. Uh, this was in the fall of... Um, 1945, the early fall, and if you remember, the war was winding jam uh, down. We had uh, the Japs on the run. We did not have very little interference from them in the air, and it could be they were setting, uh, they were flown to to Chanyi to uh, be ready for the new enemy, the communists, who would be coming out of the hill shortly taking over American airfields and begin the uh, con <clears throat> conquering of uh, China in particular. Uh, if you remember right, uh, the people involved in the Long March with their leader, Mao Tse-Sung, had been back in the hills only a few hundred miles from Chanyi for uh, most of the war, uh, regrouping and uh, getting arms. Uh, and getting ready for the Americans and the Chinese to win the war so 
uh, they can immediately jump in and take China from the Chinese nationalists with Chiang Kai-shek, uh, uh, who was head of the nationalist army. <clears throat> okay, back where we were, it had been a tough four weeks. We were taking off uh, before daylight uh, to arrive over a little strip in Burma at first light, uh, make a carrier-type landing uh, down in a canyon, uh, load 35 or 40 Chinese uh, First Army soldiers, complete with their equipment, uh, make a has take off into a box canyon and a circling climb um, oh, around and around and around and up to some 15,000 feet uh, so we could pick up a heading from uh, there to Kunming and then from Kunming uh, north northwest on to Chen Yi. Usually it was um, it was the middle of the afternoon uh, before we could um, even think about starting our return trip to Miss Mary India, our base. And uh, by the time uh, we got back to Miss Mary, some six hours after takeoff, bucking anywhere in winds 50, 75 to 100 miles an hour, with the outside temperatures maybe 40 degrees below zero at 25,000 feet. Uh, um, we were pretty well um, exhausted. Um, we were taken, after landing in Miss Mary, we were taken immediately to the flight surgeon where we were given three fingers of uh, 100 proof liquor and a water glass. Uh, the purpose of this was to um, react uh, with the benzodrine, which we had been taking in rather large amounts to keep us awake, to uh, knock it out of our system uh, where we could sleep. So you'd uh, get asleep maybe at midnight if things went well, and then you were awakened again at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, um, and you did it all over again. Uh, it was uh, very fatiguing, and there seemed to be no let up. Our CO, a former uh, United Airlines pilot, uh, did try to help. Uh, being a pilot himself, he realized. Uh, what we were going through, and uh, he would have the uh, co-pilots uh, get up before us and uh, make the airplane pre-flight check, uh, start up the engines and get them warmed up. He would have the people in operations uh, make uh, our weather report and our flight plan, and uh, But anyway, as first pilots, all we had to do was to grab a bite to eat and uh, be dropped off at the revetment by a jeep and we were ready to go. It wasn't the best way to do things, but uh, it did allow us another hour or an hour and a half sleep, uh, which was the thing that uh, we needed most in order to keep functioning. Uh, of course, uh, the co-pilots and the radio operators uh, probably ended up uh, um, needing sleep maybe more than we did, but at least they didn't have the responsibility uh, that we carry. Uh, however, often on the return trip, uh, we'd all be sort of nodding off at once, and I think... Uh, Occasionally, uh, maybe all three crewmen were asleep at the same time and the airplane would be uh, flying along on automatic pilot. In fact, as we we're almost positive, uh, that's what happened when uh, one of our C-46s uh, 
flew, flew directly into the side of Mount Tally at uh, 25,000 feet uh, in a completely CAVU, uh, beautiful weather, uh, night, and uh, of course crashed and killed all aboard. Our feeling was that um, all three pilots, uh, I mean two pilots and uh, the crewman was asleep and uh, the automatic pilot just flew them right into the side of that mount. Uh, it was a miserable return flight uh, because of the fatigue and the cold, 40 degrees. Uh, below zero was the normal outside temperature at that altitude and we uh, had no heaters in those airplanes um, there were heaters but they didn't work they were wired off we did not have electric flight suits uh, just uh, four line jackets and pants fur line jackets and pants and uh, the old GI shoes and it was um, about as miserable as it gets. Jake Foote uh, began to tell me of his first flight into this little makeshift grass and mud strip uh, in central Burma. The strip maybe was uh, 2,500 feet long and lay downhill. It had been uh, hacked out of the jungle only a few days before his landing. Uh, and since the monsoon was not completely over, it soon became a mud and grass slip. Uh, 15,000 foot uh, mountains uh, parallel the north-south runway. And to the north, uh, it was guarded uh, by a sort of uh, box canyon effect, uh, which caused you to have to uh, circle down uh, toward the field and then make a circling carrier type landing uh, with coach um, to, the, to the landing strip there. Now, this wasn't any particular problem because an empty C-46 uh, you know flew like a twin engine fighter plane. It was uh, no problem to make because it, they just any airplane feels good, flies good, empty and this one flew even better than most. Uh, to the north, that was to the north, to the to the south of the field, and we took off from the north to the south. Uh, there was, uh, at the end of the runway, there was a, a row of trees, and then if you could clear the trees, there was a little dip where you could drop the nose a degree or two and get up a little airspeed, uh, and then began a circling climb um, uh, to uh, 15,000 feet or a little more uh, where you could proceed um, to the east uh, and set your course for Kunming and then Chenyi, China. Uh, you, you had to start this climb because at least as near as we could see uh, there was no exit uh, from this uh, canyon and uh, so the only way out was to climb out. Uh, this took, at the best, an hour uh, and was a tough thing to do. Uh, to go around and around and around for one hour, gaining only just a small uh, few hundred feet uh, with every 360 degrees, uh, having to uh, sort of force the airplane around and hold the controls in certain positions uh, became very fatiguing. Uh, the flight uh, instruments, uh, what am I trying to say, the, uh, the automatic pilots of those days uh, were used primarily for straight and level flying. Uh, we did not attempt to make turns with them or anything uh, holding patterns with them like uh, is done today. They were uh, strictly used for straight and level flying in contact conditions. So this was done uh, by uh, most of the time the pilot because he had the left seat and the circling was to the left and uh, 
the planes were so overloaded that uh, we were only able to reduce throttle uh, just a few hundred RPM um, for over an hour. Uh, I don't know how those big Pratt and Whitney 2200 horsepower engines took it, but uh, most of them did. So uh, finally, uh, we, once we were on course and headed toward uh, Kunming, uh, things um, quite often became a little easier for the for the next hour. Of course, uh, with uh, the 35 uh, Chinese infantrymen in the back, uh, you were not sure what was going to happen. Uh, once we got them at altitude, most of them had finished their banging around and gotten sick or uh, tried to get up there with us, uh, put rags around their uh, face uh, to try to imitate our um, oxygen mask. Uh, they probably thought the air was poison and um, uh, they didn't have a very good time uh, until at least the altitude uh, passed them out and relieved them of their uh, misery. Uh, they only had, uh, on this particular flight, Jack said that they only had uh, one officer with them, a, a young Chinese uh, lieutenant that spoke um, a pretty good English and he kept wanting to get up front with us, but uh, we told him his place was back there with the, with the troops uh, because they can um, start raising some pretty, raising some hell back there, especially when they wake up. He said he was uh, uh, born and uh, raised in San Francisco uh, of a Chinese family. I guess he lived in Chinatown and then uh, at the advent of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Japanese attacked on the Chinese mainland had um, felt the patriotism stirring in and gone back to uh, the old country, China, to help them fight the war. He's a pretty good kid and uh, we got along with him uh, real well. Uh, Jack said that uh, the real problem with, with this whole operation was began, you might say, at the beginning. Um, when he, he was the first plane from our field to, uh, to go into this strip, and he saw, as he circled down for the, the landing, that two airplanes had uh, crashed and burned uh, just uh, south of the runway. Uh, when he got on the ground, he realized that there were no Air Corps personnel there that the only people that he ate with on the ground were um, a number of officers, American officers, that had been attached uh, to this uh, Chinese army. Uh, they really had no idea uh, about flying and they uh, made an assumption uh, that uh, 45 uh, Chinese troops would be um, uh, the correct uh, number to load on a C-46 uh, and take them on over to Chan Yi. Well, that number was incorrect and uh, was proven by the first uh, plane to try to take off of that many troops on it that uh, really hardly even cleared the ground before it smashed into the trees, killing all aboard. Uh, then they reduced the number to, uh, to 40. And uh, the second airplane uh, also crashed. Uh, it was from, uh, the first two crashes were from uh, uh, Sukhothang, uh, India. Uh, Jack could see that on the, uh, the vertical fan of one that didn't burn all the way. You could see the word Sukh, that's double O-K. Uh, they claimed to Jack that uh, the ground people did, that this plane had lost an engine, otherwise he would have made it out okay. Jack wasn't satisfied with his ex explanation and he went down to the crash of this second airplane, which was still smoldering, 
and uh, a horrible sight and horrible smell. But he determined uh, that, as far as he could tell, uh, that the engines, uh, both engines, were still putting out uh, uh, maximum power uh, when the plane uh, hit the trees. Uh, so Jack did not believe that it was a failure of an engine that caused the plane to crash. Uh, he made uh, the decision or the opinion that uh, it crashed because it was still overloaded. But Jack was a long way from being a senior officer on the uh, on the field, and he was ordered to load 40 troops in their gear and to proceed with his takeoff. Um, he agreed to do this, and um, but Jack told me he said, uh, as I taxied down the little taxi strip. Uh, toward the end of the runway, I knew that something had to be done, that I was not going to make this takeoff under those circumstances, and that if necessary, uh, I would uh, uh, <clears throat> take the plane and fit it crosswise onto the runway and kill all the engines, kill the engines, the two engines, so other planes could uh, not land or take off and uh, he said, I had no intention of killing myself and the other people aboard uh, in a fruitless attempt to make a takeoff. Uh, he said, uh, I knew I was uh, leading myself straight into a court-martial, but uh, I figured a court-martial uh, would maybe exonerate me. At least uh, it wasn't worth dying for to follow these guys' in instructions. But as he taxied down the strip, uh, maybe toward a half a mile further to the uh, to the end of the runway, he got an idea about something that he could do that might work that would uh, allow him to make a safe takeoff, and uh, still uh, not be court-martial. He told his co-pilot that about um, two-thirds of the way down the, stair, <clears throat> down the taxi strip, he'd noticed a great big muddy spot. And what he planned to do was to taxi slightly to the right and uh, into this muddy spot and to have the right gear uh, stick hold in, in the mud where he could not proceed uh, further. Now he says, when uh, when I taxi into this bad spot, he said, uh, I want you to uh, go to the back of the plane and you will feel me uh, accelerate the engines and then cut the engines back. The co-pilot was confused, but certainly was going to do what Jack asked him to do. He said, when you get to the back, open the big double cargo door, and you and the Chinese officer go and jump to the ground uh, first, and then you let the troops uh, jump after you. Uh, they, this door was on the left side of the airplane, so the troops would jump out the door and then go under the airplane toward the, uh, away from the runway. Uh, the idea being that uh, if he was questioned about what he was doing, which he was, well, that he would tell the uh, people on the radio uh, who were inquiring what was going on that uh, in order for him to get out of the mud, he was going to have to uh, uh, unload the, the cargo, which was the troops. Uh, so they, uh, as Jack said, now this is going to be, he told the co-pilot, this is going to be a pretty good drop, but since it's muddy out there, I don't think the jump is going to injure anybody. And uh, then you get the Chinese officer to form him up on the right-hand side of the plane, and we'll get the plane out, and then we'll load them back up. Well, Jack had a method in his madness there, 
as uh, as the uh, the Chinese were deathly afraid of airplane flights. Most of them, they were terrified of where they were going uh, to fight again. Nobody told them anything, and uh, what happened was that. Um, while the uh, Chinese lieutenant was trying to get his troops lined up uh, on the right side of the airplane, um, uh, uh, four or five of them uh, saw a chance to uh, make a break for the jungle, which was maybe 50 or 75 yards away. Um, they got a good head start before the uh, Chinese officer ever spot uh, uh, spotted them. He hollered for them to stop, <clears throat> and they just went right on and were soon disappeared into the jungle. Uh, others start to do that, and but that by that time the officer had control of the situation and forced them back with his gun and told them he would uh, shoot them if they followed the others, and undoubtedly he would have. But this way, uh, Jack was able to get his <coughs> load reduced. Uh, by five, it could have been pulled out with the um, with the with the troops still on board. Uh, if with a truck with a you know a cable or a hitch on to it, but um, uh, Jack was not particularly interested in knowing that that could be done, and that's the reason that he unloaded them. Five of them got away, and he loaded um, load them back on. But this time he had 35 instead of 40. Uh, he uh, uh, then proceeded to the end of the runway and made sort of a, um, a turn onto the runway uh, to gather a little speed and uh, started down the runway. And uh, due to the mud and grass and stuff and the wheels, it uh, picked up uh, speed very slowly. But it, uh, as he approached the end of the runway, he could feel that the airplane got light, and so uh, about that time that uh, she started to break loose, uh, he put down half flaps and uh, ballooned up over the trees and made a clean takeoff. Then he eased the nose down a little bit to gain some airspeed down in the canyon below and uh, started his circling um, circles, circling 360-degree circles. Uh, up to 15,000 feet to um, start over the main hump to China. Uh, by the way, this uh, plane was, uh, this field was about uh, 6,000 feet above sea level. And of course, you get a lot of engine inefficiency um, at that altitude compared to making takeoffs at sea level. And um, Jack uh, made the comment to me that. It didn't take a slide rule genius to uh, figure out that at 6,500 feet, it's a 2,500 foot runway and trees at, at the end, um, and loss of power due to altitude, that um, uh, this plane, uh, uh, just uh, by all the laws of physics, was not going to make it with the load that they had on it. And when he got a thousand pounds off, then it was able to make that, uh, that takeoff. Uh, one thing that uh, Jack from, forgot to mention uh, to me, but I, I know the answer to it, so I'll tell you, if the people had to jump out or jump off uh, to unload, how did they get back on? Uh, of course, really the answer is uh, very simple. Uh, then um, they dropped the ladder from the, uh, the ladder that you carried in the airplane. Uh, we dropped that from the uh, from the airplane to the ground and loaded them back on uh, one at a time as they climbed the ladder. So there wasn't any big secret uh, or any misinformation about that. It took a little longer, but they were back on in, oh, maybe five, seven, and a half minutes. Didn't take long to load them. Uh, Jack instructed the uh, radio operator that as soon as he could make uh, contact uh, with any station to patch a message through to the, our CO at Miss Merrill that uh, to give orders that uh, no plane would make a takeoff from that field with more than 35 troops aboard. And uh, in the message, uh, he requested that um, 
that Air Force uh, people, uh, highest rank possible, would be dispatched immediately to that airfield in order to uh, get uh, control of the situation. Um, some time, and unfortunately, um, before it could be implemented, there was another uh, plane loss from uh, Sukhothing and another plane loss from uh, Miss America. Uh, Jack was telling me that just because he uh, had made a clean uh, takeoff, he knew that his uh, troubles were far from over. Uh, the airplane that uh, he had flown from Miss America to this field uh, was uh, badly out of rig. Uh, he said it was so uh, right wing heavy that uh, he had had to use almost um, uh, full uh, left wing tab uh, to uh, bring the wing up uh, and some left rudder to get it uh, flying any semblance of straight and level, hands off. And that the indicated airspeed uh, was down about 10 miles per hour, slower than it should be, uh, which would indicate that the uh, plane was not in proper trim and that uh, it was flying uh, rather sideways through the air, a very inefficient uh, way to go. So this was going to add up uh, later on in the flight uh, just to uh, a potential disaster. Uh, Jack said on the uh, circling uh, trip up to from the 6,000 feet elevation to 15,000 feet elevation. It took an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, he had had to go uh, full throttle almost the entire time. And the full flow, fuel flow meter was uh, showing about 40% uh, uh, more fuel being used uh, than it would ordinarily have required due to the fact that the airplane was uh, so much out of trim. And as he, soon as he got to altitude and set course for uh, Kunming, uh, he realized that uh, he'd be very lucky if he had um, fuel enough to reach Kunming uh, and certainly not fuel enough on board to reach uh, Chan Yi. In fact, Jack said, as um, they proceeded, uh, he had to let the airplane uh, uh, drift southward uh, in order to find some lower level uh, mountains to cross uh, because it just would not maintain the altitude he needed and uh, kept wanting to lose altitude and he couldn't uh, just continue to run the, uh, to use full power on those Pratt & Whitney engines. Uh, that was just expecting too much and using too much full fuel. So he began to go south, of course, to, uh, to lower level mountains uh, where he could uh, maybe hold an altitude of 14,000 feet and then uh, he uh, hoped to cross an intersecting line uh, uh, some time later and uh, make a northerly turn uh, towards Kunming uh, and hopefully to uh, land there instead of continuing on uh, to Chen Yi. But even that turned out to be possible. Um, he was, uh, when he made his turn to the north, he was about 100 miles uh, south of Kunming and uh, with no hope of uh, reaching the field.